This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources. Consistent with its running right process, Alpha is an energy company committed to being a leader in mine safety and an environmental steward. We fuel progress around the world. More information at alphanr.com. Haley Buick GMC. The place for a new Verano or Terrain Denali. On Midlothian Turnpike in Richmond and online at haleybuickgmc.com. Taking it to the streets and helping our community. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Information at vachamber.com. It's amazing what my students with special needs can accomplish. Their pride is priceless. That's why I teach. Brought to you by the Virginia Education Association, because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond, and might I say welcome back Thank you. To, to Dr. Reed. Appreciate very much your being on This Week in Richmond. Uh, last week we had a brief conversation, but there's so much more for you to tell our viewers about the 1950s, starting the Crusade for Voters, the 1960s, you're serving in the General Assembly, the, the first African American to serve since Reconstruction a long, long period of decades uh, prior to uh, your breaking that barrier. So if, if you would, start some uh, earlier if you want to, but if not, start with the crusade and talk about how it came into being here, the crusade for voters in Richmond. I'll be delighted to do that, to do that and thanks for inviting me back. Uh, when I came back to Richmond in 1955, uh, the big issue was save our schools. They uh, were having a referendum to decide whether or not uh, the state should continue with this massive resistance or go on and integrate the schools. They, of course, uh, the referendum was a failure for the progressives who wanted to integrate the schools. So we took a look at what was going on. Uh, the NAACP was very active in all of the uh, civil rights movements. They had several court cases uh, throughout the South uh, trying to integrate schools and break down some of the barriers. Uh, because they were so active, the General Assembly uh, was trying to put them out of business by demanding that they turn over the membership list of all the members in Virginia mm -hmm. and, uh, the, uh, as members of the NAACP. Of course, they resisted this because to turn over the membership, most of the members were throughout in the rural counties, counties dominated by the bird machine, and for their names to be publicized, they would be harassed and maybe uh, reprimanded or lose their jobs or lose their homes. So the NAACP fought that. There was in the NAACP a committee on voter registration, voter education, uh, because of the conditions and the attitude against the NAACP, it was decided that uh, that committee would be separated and as a result of that, the Crusade for Voters was founded. Most of the members of the Crusade were members of the Voter Registration Committee, committee of the NAACP. Mm -hmm. So really it was the same organization with a different name. Uh, the NAACP was able to go along and continue their fight in the courts. Uh, we all know about Oliver Hill, Henry Marsh, and 
Tucker and the others who carried on that fight. Uh, so the crusade decided that they wanted to try a new approach. Uh, voter registration, voter education, and get out the vote. That would be the main issues that we would uh, consider. Uh, at that time, uh, the city council had nine members, and the members were elected at large. The large elections are an attempt to gerrymander to prevent right, the right. minority groups from yes. uh, really getting representation on the uh, government body. Because of that, we decided that our best approach would be to try to organize individual precinct organizations in each precinct. Uh, we felt we would do that because in politics you have to organize your business according to political lines, and precincts are definitely a political indication. Most politicians know what a precinct is, but they would not know what uh, Maymount Civic Club is. But if they say we have Maymount Civic Club, and we represent Precinct 25, their ears will perk up and they'll listen. So initially we went into each of the precincts. Uh, we felt of the 68 precincts at that time, maybe 28 of them were predominantly black or we had sufficient number of black voters to carry that particular precinct. So we set out to organize individual precinct clubs in each of those 28 uh, predominantly black precincts. I won't go into the details because it uh, takes a lot of patience and time to start oh, sure. with two or three people to eventually get people involved in the entire precinct. But we were successful. Uh, we started off, uh, Johnny Brooks and Bill Thornton and I, we each lived in different precincts. So to test our theory, we said, well, uh, first we should start our own precinct. So each of us went into our precincts to start setting up a little nucleus of three or four people. We expanded to maybe five or six. Then we would have a meeting in a church. Then we'd take them through organizing the civic organization, gave them a uh, constitution, bylaws, and we got them to the point where they elected officers and they set up individual organizations within these precincts. Uh, they were autonomous. Uh, we had no control over them. Our idea was that we would work with them uh, we would advise them, and we would recommend uh, people for them to vote for that we thought would be in their best interest. So that's basically how we got started, and uh, that was one of the reasons that we were able to have some success because we did have the precincts organized and we were able to uh, inform the politicians that these are the people that you're going to have to deal with because these are the voters. These are the ones that will vote for you and help you get elected. So at that time, as the crusade was starting and as you worked in those three precincts to begin with, you were battling, I guess, the poll tax was still there. Yes, it was. It was poll tax. Not only the poll tax, but as blacks got more involved in voting, they uh, began to put up other obstacles. Yes. Uh, blank paper registration. There were about 12 questions that you had to know in order to register. But they would give you a, a blank piece of paper and tell you to answer the questions. So that meant we had to school all of the people on the questions, uh, run through mock uh, examinations and taught them how to fill out like those questions. Uh, the poll tax was interesting in that uh, you had to pay it six months prior to an election. Uh, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. at that time, the Democratic Party was the only party. Uh, there were no Republicans. So the primary was a big thing, and the primary was timed in the summer when most people were on vacations and only the pure and hot would go out to turn out in the primary. Because there were no Republicans running, the primary was, if you won the primary, that was the election, which was in November. Uh, again, in November, all of the Democrats would form organizations Democrats for Eisenhower, Democrats for uh, Goldwater. So we had nobody to vote for in the Democratic Party uh, here. We would vote for the National Democrat. Well, in order to participate in the Democratic Party, uh, they 
apportion the number of people you could have on the Democratic committees by the number of people who voted for Byrd in his last election. Oh, and naturally, yes. none of the progressives voted for Byrd. So we were caught in a, a situation where uh, we wanted to be Democrats, but the Democrats did not want us. So along this, along this journey that you were on, you decided to run for the General Assembly. Well, I really didn't decide myself. It was thrust what, upon you. Well, eventually. Well, what happened is that we were able to work with some young uh, progressive Democrats. And uh, because of that, we were able to make inroads into the Democratic Party. Uh, and as more blacks got involved in the Democratic Party, and the Democrats depended on uh, the black vote in order to get elected, we were able to convince them that uh, uh, they should support candidates of uh, black candidates. So we started with the city council, which was supposed to be nonpartisan, but uh, there are two groups there that the, what I call the establishment that ran uh, the city council at that time. We had city council of nine members and uh, city manager, uh, but the establishment supported the nine people that they wanted. So in order to make inroads, we would have to uh, put up one or two candidates to run and support them. Uh, it eventually got to the point that this crusade endorsement was uh, really helped people get elected, and we were able to use that to bargain to get blacks on the slate of the city council. And then, uh, as the black vote got larger, the General Assembly decided that they wanted to gerrymander Richmond. Uh, Richmond had five delegates, and Henrico had three. Uh, because they could not uh, annex any more territory, they decided that we would elect eight delegates from Richmond and Henrico combined. So that meant that if you wanted to run for uh, House of Delegates, you had to run almost in a congressional district. So we were able to work with the Democrats uh, to kind of get them to put a black on the slate. Uh, I was one of the persons doing the negotiation, and uh, we agreed on a person that uh, we would get to run and that we thought would run. But at the last minute, he decided that he would not mm -hmm. run. So I, it was thrust upon me because they knew me and I'd been working with them that they would uh, want me on the slate, that they would be able to support a black. Uh, so that's how I got uh, onto the slate in, originally. So the first year you, first time you ran, you didn't win, but then you won the second time. Right. It was very interesting. On the first time I ran, um, we ran with a slate of eight of us, and at that time, Mills Gardner was running for the governor. Uh, I forget exactly who was running for lieutenant governor and attorney general. I think Fred Pollard was running for lieutenant governor. Um, I lost the, the primary by uh, about 38 votes. Uh, we had a recount, and during the recount, they were not able to find the ballots uh, from the skip with precinct. And because those valid ballots could not be counted, I won the primary. The person that I defeated, his name was T. Dick Sutton, uh, was able to rally around a lot of conservative groups who were against uh, integration, uh, and they had a write-in for him, and he was able to defeat me in the write-in. Um, so I did not win the, the general election uh, the first time around. Second time around, we uh, worked with some of our people, friends, we kind of made an assessment of what went wrong and how we could uh, make a better showing the next time. Uh, the next time around was I was successful and all you had to do was be part of the top eight, uh, but I was able to finish much higher than the eighth position. So I was pretty well in a good situation from then on. So that, that was 1967. Right. Which it had been literally decades since any African-American had served in the General Assembly. Well, it really since Reconstruction. Immediately after Reconstruction, uh, the, there were many blacks in the General Assembly, some in Congress, 
uh, here in Virginia, I think around 60-some during the course between emancipation and uh, the Constitution Convention. Because of the black vote back there in 1902 and blacks were being elected to public office, the forefather of the bird machine, Carter Glass, uh, and his group had a Constitutional Convention in 1902, at which time uh, they passed all of the Jim Crow laws and they passed the, the uh, poll tax laws. Poll tax a dollar and a half. You had to pay for three years prior to, to the election and you had to pay, pay it six months prior to that election. At the time that Carter Glass was pushing this through, uh, some of his fellow uh, legislators said, uh, look, Carter, uh, this is going to hurt a whole lot of poor white folks. They're not going to be able to vote either. And his response was said, that's exactly what we want. We don't want any, he used the N-word, all poor white votes, folks voting in Virginia. Mm. And that mm. really has persisted, you know, from that right. on. Yes. Uh, the, end, the poll tax eventually was done away with, and we were able to uh, uh, get more voters. And as a result of that, after the passage of the Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act, we were able to, you know, get uh, persons voted, uh, it, uh, registered without any problem. And I think if you live long enough, as I have, you're going to find that history does repeat itself. Uh, 1902, mm -hmm. obstacles to voting. Here in the present General Assembly, they're reenacting uh, voter ID laws, uh, doing away with some of the uh, absentee ballots. They're making it more restrictive. So we've gone through this before. You know, we're reinventing the wheel. And it looks like the opposition will never give up. They, they never will say, okay, uh, we lost. Now let's see what we can do to make Virginia better. But Virginia is constantly in the forefront of some way of perpetuating the old uh, myth of the South. And uh, it's unfortunate. Mm. Uh, I think Virginia was, had the great opportunity uh, right after the, uh, Silver, the Supreme Court decision to integrate schools, I think Virginia could have been a leader. And I think if the Richmond newspapers and the Main Street lawyers and the bankers <coughs> who were controlling the bird machine at that time had been more realistic in taking the forefront and the leadership in uh, obeying the edicts of the Supreme Court, which we were all taught to do when we took civics in school, uh, then I think the Virginia would be a much more progressive state. But it looks like we have to fight the old battles over and over again. You know, one of the battles that's being fought again, uh, somewhat comparable in a way, I think, to those gerrymandered district issues that you raised back in the 60s. And then, as our, if our viewers don't know, we'll remind them that the House of Delegates ran three years in a row in 1981, 82, 83, after it was determined that single member districts right. was the only legal option. Right. So, so now in 2015, uh, a, a case where depositions are being taken, the outcome to be determined, but has to do with the charges that there's gerrymandering in the so-called African-American districts in the House of Delegates. Right. And Congress is uh, on the third, started with the third congressional district. Um, I'm not optimistic that our General Assembly is going to do anything. I think they're going to procrastinate as long as they can, and the courts are going to finally have to uh, uh, either do it themselves or get some other uh, authority to do it. Uh, as a spinoff of that, the, uh, the case for the House districts. So once they start gerrymandering or rearranging the districts, you're going to have a spinoff effect that's not only going to affect the 3rd Congressional District, but probably 1st, 2nd, 4th, and possibly the 5th. Uh, and that once they start with the House, 
it probably would take all of the many more of the house districts in than we can imagine because there'll be a spinoff and once you get the yes. dominoes falling it's going to fall uh, further you know back in january of this year when the general assembly convened there was the impression that many had that the general assembly prior to their adjournment in April would be redrawing congressional districts. But as you said, due to appeals and, and taking it slowly, here, here we are into the summer, and that hasn't occurred. Right. There, you know, we don't, we don't report on rumors, but certainly there's some speculation that the General Assembly could be called back into special session before this calendar year is out to, to draw the congressional districts again but if that doesn't occur, then it, it may be left to the courts. Well, if, I, if somebody wanted to bet me, I would bet <laughs> that they don't come back. Yes. Uh, the tendency is to put off, put off, and put off until somebody makes them uh, reapportion it. Now, one other thing that happened uh, where, where some barriers were broken that really important for all Virginians has to do with who serves as a page in the Senate and the House. And, and we were having some conversation, and I was saying that my daughter served as a page in the House. Uh, but, but tell our viewers about breaking that color barrier. Right. Uh, when I was elected, uh, one of the things I wanted to do is to make sure that we'd have a black uh, young fellow uh, as a page. And uh, because I worked as a team, wasn't any problem getting the support of the uh, Richmond Henrico delegation. And on the other side, Sergeant Reynolds uh, said that, well, uh, we need a female page, you know. And so he was instrumental in getting uh, a first female page uh, in the General Assembly. So two uh, barriers were broken at that particular time. And if one looks at the pictures of the pages now, the, their annual picture, it's really... Uh, a good cross-section of the right. Commonwealth. That's the way it should be, yeah. Yeah. And in fact, some have commented that the pictures of the pages are more of a cross-section of the Commonwealth than a picture of the members of the General Assembly. True. <laughs> well, we have to correct that also. And I think uh, with this coming election, there are many uh, more uh, blacks running and there are some Asians running. And uh, so there's some Hispanics running, so hopefully hopefully we will have diversification of the General Assembly much more. Dr. Reed, you've uh, not just experienced, but you've been a leader in the Commonwealth, and folks who are in the Richmond area know you, know your leadership. As you uh, look into your crystal ball, any, uh, any, any words of wisdom that you could share with us about how you see things developing as we, uh, uh, in the decade before you celebrate your 100th birthday? <laughs> well, hopefully, uh, we, being a Democrat, I'm partisan, you know, that we would be able to get a majority by 2021 when reapportionment comes up. In order to do that, we have to elect probably seven uh, new Democrats in addition to those that we're losing in 2015, 2017, 2019. Hopefully we can take the Senate uh, back this year because we do have a lot of Democrats retiring, but hopefully we have enough Democrats elected to replace them and also to pick up two or three additional seats. Uh, we're working on it and uh, uh, the voters have to learn that they are in charge and uh, we often hear people being discouraged about well, you have to have X number of dollars to run, and uh, we feel that uh, you have to do it with votes, and the voters are the people, and we have to motivate the people because they are the power, but they don't realize that they, uh, the power exists within them. You know, there's a tendency of some to be high-tech, and we were talking about this, but uh, it's really the, the high-touch. It's the people connecting with, with people, and... Uh, Dr. William Ferguson Reed, uh, a leader here in the Commonwealth, we thank you so much for being on This Week in Richmond and for the uh, 
living history that you've shared and from your perspectives too on the state of the Commonwealth at this time. And we look forward to having a conversation with you. We won't wait again until your 100th birthday, but we <laughs> hope we, not. We, we very much appreciate your being on this week in Richmond. Yeah, thank you so very much for inviting me. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources, a leader in mine safety and an environmental steward. Haley Buick GMC, in Richmond and online at HaleyBuickGMC.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. The Virginia Education Association, because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.